not about the other one. So it's about learning and experimenting with technology. And also, obviously, um, at least for me, being somebody very much uh, involved in the uh, free software community, uh, that, uh, well, in the free software community, not many people have managed uh, to do that before with uh, free and open source software. Um, obviously, um, I'm sorry for the missing uh, carriage return at the end of the slide. Um, obviously, uh, once you run your own network, you are actually have the foundation of being able to practically demonstrate uh, already theoretically known GSM security problems. Right? You might go online and search for GSM security, and you might find some papers, and maybe somebody has written that theoretically you could do this or that. But how do you actually do it? And for many of the, the, the attacks, or even for learning how the technology works that you use in these attacks, you actually have to have your own network to be able to play with it. Um, and so for me, it's sort of building the foundation of enabling myself and other people to do more security research in GSM, which in the end will be uh, the necessary um, uh, means to achieve more public awareness about the lack of security in the GSM network. Um, if you look at today's internet security, where you know, if you do online banking or anything sensitive, you use uh, SSL-based encryption with reasonably well-designed ciphers and so on. Yes, of course, we have just heard the, um, you know, the, uh, yesterday uh, the very certificate problems and implementation problems and so on. But in general, the security level you have when communicating over you know, state-of-the-art internet technologies is so much higher than if you use GSM. And that's something that many people don't really realize. And unless we are able to run our own network, and on that network be able to demonstrate security problems in a way that the general public realizes there is a problem, we will not change anything in this uh, uh, current uh, situation of insecurity. So, well, legal disclaimer, don't try this at home. Um, GSM operates in a licensed spectrum. It's not like Wi-Fi where everyone can just put up his own transmitter and receiver. So since it is a licensed spectrum, in order to operate your own GSM network, you need approval from the respective regulatory authority, um, such as the, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce Dutch correctly, but here in the Netherlands, it's the Agentschap Telekom. And um, uh, so, they need to give you a license to actually use that frequency. Um, so if you want to do any of the things that I'm describing here, um, first get approval from the regulatory. If you do not use your transmitting equipment with dummy loads, if you put a dummy load on your transmitter, you can still receive it with a phone in like a meter distance. That's OK, right? Um, but it's not you know, going anywhere uh, in, in, in the uh, vicinity. Um, and especially do not interfere with operators. The whole point of running your own network is to be able to do security research without interfering with the production network. So you can demonstrate and prototype something um, and then raise attention about it. It's not you know, about actively disturbing uh, commercial networks. Um, the software we wrote is strictly for research purpose. It's not meant to be a you know, professional, high quality, robust, high service level, whatever, GSM network software. It's written as a research tool, and um, it's written uh, with that kind of concept in mind. Even though you can see it can be used for a network of, of the size of this uh, uh, camp, where we literally have uh, uh, more than 400 GSM phones right now using the network, um, making calls and, and uh, doing SMS. So a little bit of background about the GSM network architecture. Unfortunately, there is no hitchhiker's guide to GSM network protocols. Um, the literature you can find um, is typically very high level. This literature addresses people who want to deploy GSM networks and who want to um, decide where to put their cell towers and in which distance, how to organize their network, these kind of things. So if you want to work for an operator and, and deploy and manage the network, then that's the kind of literature you need. For implementing the GSM protocols, there's very little useful literature out there. Um, 
On the other hand, the entire protocol specifications are publicly available um, for download. You can just go to the ETSI or the 3GPP website and download those specifications. But at the time I did this, it was 1,108 PDF files and 414 megabytes of total text. Um, uh, I don't know the number of lines or whatever it is, but it is a lot, as you can see. I mean, only those specifications that we definitely need to use for a minimal network setup, uh, the specifications easily go to somewhere, I would say, around uh, two to 3,000 pages, the absolute minimum subset of the protocols. Um, so how does this entire network work? Um, a number of people in here will, will already know some of that uh, information, because you might have had some GSM communications lecture in, in your university course or something. I'm sorry for that, but still many people do not know the basic architecture of the network. So I have to make this uh, uh, you know, slight uh, excurs, a uh, slight deviation into, into what uh, the GSM network is and how it works. So first of all, like all traditional telecommunication networks, it is a bit synchronous network, which means everything is synchronized. Uh, it's the same like an ISDN or SDH network where your phone at home and every other phone that is connected to the same network operate on the same synchronized bit clock, and everything is, is uh, centralized uh, clocked. Um, the layer two on GSM, uh, and I'm talking about the layer two of the AIR interface here, is modeled after Q921, which is the LAFD protocol also used in ISDN networks, which many people are uh, at least a little bit familiar with. And the call signaling is modeled after Q931, which is the layer three protocol on any ESD, ISDN line um, in Europe, at least. Oh, I think uh, generally, um, sort of, yeah, yeah, uh, everywhere. Um, there are many more protocols for mobility management, radio resource management, um, organization and maintenance, and other uh, aspects of the protocol. Um, also, it is like other traditional telecommunications protocols that the intelligence is in the network, not in the end nodes. Right? The TCP IP internet differentiates itself very much from other networks that existed before or that existed in other realms, such as GSM or traditional you know, ISDN or other networks, where in, in TCP IP, the internet paradigm is the end to end. You have stupid machines in the, in, the, in the network which just pass packets from left to right, and the intelligence of the protocol stack is in the actual end nodes. Whereas on GSM or other uh, 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 telephone protocols, the intelligence is in the network and the end equipment, which is your handset or GSM modem or whatever you might use, um, is a very, very stupid device that only executes what the network tells it to do. It's a very like master-slave kind of architecture. And GSM is also a, what I would call a TDMA nightmare. Um, if you have worked with you know, Ethernet or related technologies such as wireless, uh, you know, 802.11 wireless networks or uh, even Bluetooth or whatever other protocols, um, you typically have you know, a packet and each packet contains the source and a destination address, you know, source and destination MAC address in case of Ethernet and related uh, technologies on layer two and on layer three you have a source and destination IP address. Um, in the GSM network, you don't have that. Each packet really only contains the payload of the packet, and depending on which time frame it is 